Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is a book club episode presented by your brothers in Christ, Nick and Peter from the Guilt Grace Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. After this episode, check out our show notes for today's book, a link to today's book by Dr. K.J. Drake, The Flesh of the Word. It's published by Oxford University Press, and you can order yourself a copy there. Also, there's a link to our network of the, of the Society of Reformed Podcasters and a link to North American Presbyterian and Reformed Churches, as well as another link for Baptist brothers and sisters to find a church near you. Again, for today's book club, we have Dr. K.J. Drake, and he'll be talking to us about his book, the Flesh of the Word, published by Oxford University Press. All right, I'll hand it off to Peter. Yeah, so we have Dr. Drake. He's the Sessional Assistant Professor of History at Redeemer University in Canada. Grew up in Nebraska, received his bachelor's from University of Nebraska, went to Covenant Theological Seminary, got his MDiv, went to St. Louis University, got his PhD in Historical Theology, and his research focused on the development of Reformed understanding of Christology in the Re Reformation period, which is a lot of the stuff we're talking about today. So thanks for coming on to talk about your book, Dr. Drake. It's a great, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to be with you guys today. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Yes. Go Huskers, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Yeah. What about the I'm really happy we got a Nebraska guy on here. Hmm. And ne Nebraska to Canada. How did that happen? Um, well, so uh, I ended up getting a position up here teaching history at a reform school. And so, yeah, this was kind of the end goal was to be able to teach theology and teach some history as well. So very cool. Nice. So this book, um, I just wanted to, you know, open it up with the first question. But before I do that, it's always kind of nice to kind of get a framework of if if one was to pick up this book off of the, I guess, the online bookshelf. Now you can't really go to a physical bookshelf anymore, it seems like. What kind of prerequisite knowledge, if any, should somebody have before kind of considering getting a lot out of this? Yeah, so the book is a bit of a technical overview of Christology in the 16th century. But I, I think that with a, a basic grounding in the doctrines of Christ, what does it mean that Christ is both fully God and fully man? What do we mean when we say that Christ is one person in two natures? Um, and having a basic framework of kind of how the Reformation worked out with some of its major figures like Zwingli and Luther. Um, I hope the book is clear enough that if you come with that level of understanding and kind of walk you into some of these um, more obscure waters or uh, maybe deeper questions, depending on how you want to think about it. Okay, cool. So what from there, what influenced you to or led you to write this book? Because um, there are some other books out there on Christology. So what makes this book particularly different? Yeah, so this book is diving into a very specific question of Christology, specifically how is it that Christ is both fully human and fully divine with respect to omnipresence especially? What does it mean that Christ is simultaneously everywhere and that he took a human form, that he took a human nature, that he was in a place, that he was in a time? Um, this doctrine has the rather unwieldy name, the extra Calvinisticum, yeah. which I'll define a little bit yeah. more for you later on. I first got introduced to this idea at seminary. And one of my professors laid it out for us in a class on Christology. I just always thought it was a remarkably fascinating doctrine. Uh, Calvin calls it something marvelous, this kind of attempting to reckon with Christ's two natures. And I remember distinctly um, helping a, a friend study for finals on this and explaining it to him over and over um, at 3 a.m. in the morning once. <laughs> and then when I got into my PhD work, I was kind of looking for where is some place that I can add to our understanding. And so I focused on this doctrine and specifically how it kind of unfolded during the period of the Reformation. Hmm, okay. So, I mean, a little bit of background too. And you, you talked about the word extra Calvinisticum. And I'm going to guess your average Reformed or Calvinist leading person is like, we get more of John Calvin. This is fantastic. <laughs> 
<laughs> but what what does i remember it was it was five points of calvinism when i first learned about it i was like there's a six point of calvinism this is this is amazing but it's not the six points what is can you define extra calvinisticum yeah definitely so it comes from the latin and it's most literally translated that calvinist beyond idea um you can probably guess from that translation it wasn't re really a term that the calvinist enjoyed yeah but yep. that's where the name comes from through kind of disagreements with Lutheranism. But what it's really trying to get at is how do we understand the two natures in the one person of Christ? Okay. And most simply defined, it means that Christ, when he was incarnate, when the eternal word took on human flesh, he was not confined to his human body or confined to the world. Yeah. But he was with his disciples. He was with them in human form while simultaneously being everywhere as the mm. divine son. And this relationship of his presence in his human body and his infinite um, omnipresence as the divine son continues throughout his entire career from the earthly ministry through the ascension and through his second coming. And this is an essential way of understanding what does it even mean to say that Christ is fully human and fully divine. Huh. And before before we get into the next question too that Nick will ask, there's also ubiquity. I know that's something that Lutherans use. Can you define ubiquity as well? Because I know it plays into this as well. Yeah. So this topic really comes out of debates during the Reformation. Now, I should say, first of all, the the idea of the extra Calvinisticum predates the Reformation completely. Hmm. You'll find this expressed in the church fathers, in the medievals, throughout this. Yeah. What changes in the period of the Reformation is, I'd like to say, it becomes a doctrine. Before that, it's an idea, and you see it here and there as kind of an expression of praise. Isn't it amazing that Christ was with us and infinite at the same time? You see that throughout Athanasius, you see it in Augustine and others. But during the Reformation, this began to be challenged, and it was specifically this doctrine of ubiquity, uh, from the Lutheran side, which originates with Luther and is developed later on. And this idea is that at some point, and there's debate on when, Christ's human nature receives the property of omnipresence. Huh. And so Christ's human body does become everywhere in some sense. And that's what the Lutherans mean by ubiquity. Now, the Lutherans don't always love that term, but it is the kind of the general one of it. Yeah. And so in response to ubiquity, the reformed have to develop their own doctrine in response. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think some of um, broadly evangelical or just kind of majority of people might get confused on what, what is Lutheranism and what is reformed because mm -hmm. Martin Luther started was the, the reformer. So I could see how people are kind mm -hmm. of mixed these waters a little bit, mm -hmm. but without getting into the weeds about it, there is the historic Lutheranism that you did bring up. And then there is the reformed church, the confessionally reformed church as we know. Um, so could you briefly talk about how there's a difference between historic Lutheranism and how they understand Christ in the relationship to the sacraments versus our reformed churches? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So um, actually, the story of why we get these two traditions is deeply bound up with this question of the extra Calvinisticum. Yeah. So Luther begins in Germany, and shortly thereafter, Zwingli begins working in Switzerland. And at this point, they, they kind of know about each other eventually, but they're not of one movement. And they meet at a colloquy or a meeting called Marburg in 1529. And it's over the issue of the Lord's Supper but it's also over the issue of Christ. Huh. And how do we understand who Christ is and how his human body relates to the Lord's Supper? And they can't come to an agreement with Luther arguing uh, for something like ubiquity, that Christ's body is everywhere, and Zwingli arguing, no, Christ's body is in heaven. It's ascended to the right hand of the Father. And so this then develops into these two traditions. There are other differences, but those are some of the main ones. Um, and, or well, one of the inciting differences between them, rather. And so this question of how do we understand Christ's body? Um, is it in heaven? Um, or does it take this property that seems to only apply to the divine? 
And Luther, kind of going with his general impulses, argues for the mystery here. And so for him, we need to define the Lord's Supper around trusting the words of Christ. So Luther says quite clearly, when Christ says, this is my body, it is his body. And therefore, we must believe. We must not put human reason over and above God and say that he can't do this. Zwingli, on the other hand, in the reform say, Luther, we agree with you. We believe in scripture. We don't want to put human wisdom and tradition over it. But at the same time, we think, you know, reason is a good gift and we should use it. And what you're proposing isn't a mystery, but a contradiction. And so the Lutherans would argue, um, and I, it's hard not to get in the weeds too much on this, but in the Lord's Supper especially, Christ's body is in, with, and under the sacramental elements. So he is corporally present is the best way to say it. Now, what does that mean? Yeah. It's tricky. <laughs> um, but the key is that when you take the Lord's Supper, Christ's body and blood is there. And so is the bread and the wine. That's one of the main differences with them and the Roman Catholic. Now, the Reformed would reject that and say that, no, the elements do not change, but Christ is there in the partaking, in the act. And he is spiritually present, as Calvin will argue, mm -hmm. by connecting us to his ascended body. And so the Lord's Supper is an upward movement mm -hmm. of the believing church to the ascended Christ, not as the Lutherans would have it, a downward movement of the body into the elements. Oh, that's, yeah, that's great. Uh, do you mind if I jump in just to see if I can, uh, if I'm on the same page with you? Because I'm kind of representing more of the, the maybe the, the broader audience as well. And I grew up uh, Roman Catholic. So this is extra fascinating to me that with this explanation. Um, and I think what, what you're saying is post ascension and post Pentecost, now that the Holy spirit is really running the church age, it's really the Holy spirit through that's present at the sacraments. It's not Christ's actual body that is present because he, his physical body is in heaven. Um, and with my past Roman Catholic uh, sacraments, we would believe that he was actually, we were, he was physically there through the sacraments. But um, yeah, so l let me just jump on that a sec. Yeah, please, so please. The spirit is present, but he makes us present to Christ, if you will. There we go. So yeah. It's not just that the Holy Spirit is present. Christ is also present in his divinity. And we are metaphorically, in some ways, mystically lifted up to partake of him. So when we partake of the Lord's Supper, according uh, to Calvin and the broader tradition, we are really receiving Christ's benefits and we are communing with the ascended Christ. Yeah. Um, and the reform would say that's where the mystery is, is the communion. The mystery isn't in the elements themselves. There we go. Yeah, so it's be, well, I mean, I think you're explaining something I've never heard of before versus the dissension down, which he's already has descended in, in his incarnation. Because he's now ascended, we now ascend to him through the spirit mm. in the sacraments. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And that's, I mean, to broaden it out, that's us in some ways getting a foretaste of yeah. the eternal worship that's of the good, yeah. God in heaven. Yeah, that's uh, good. And that kind of breaking down of the already and not yet the the not yet becomes more real as we partake of the body and blood of christ um and so there's a real communion going on there is a what the reform call a real spiritual presence but it is not a corporeal presence the the elements do not change mm -hmm. but christ is still with us in a unique way yeah we're in a yeah kind of a real sense we're tasting a bit of heaven yeah. when it comes to the sacraments because yeah. of Christ's work and because he's ascended. Exactly. It has an eschatological flavor to it for sure. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and which that's, <clears throat> it's different than when I grew up, I just didn't know how to explain this stuff. I didn't know how to explain Christ who natures and, and any of this stuff. So <clears throat> uh, 
so how and why did you choose i mean you went above luther and, and calvin to choose zwingli and a couple of the guys why did you choose these theologians mm-hmm. in tracing the, theolog- the theologians that you chose in tracing extra calvinisticum and the ubiquity with christ to nature's his presence and all that. So why, why the theologians that you chose? Mm-hmm. So this- one of the things when I started researching this, and I think people got a little distracted by the name. So it's called the extra Calvinisticum. So your first thought would be, I'll look at Calvin, right? And Calvin does have some statements about it, but frankly, he doesn't go into a lot of depth. He talks about this in the Institutes and there's some famous passages there, but really he doesn't dig all that deep. And I was wondering, well, where does this actually come from? I mean, we're very quick to jump to Calvin, um, but Calvin's not the entire tradition. So I did really want to back up and look at Zwingli, the originator of the Reformed tradition. And while he and Calvin have some disagreements, um, they are kind of unified in the tradition. So I spent a lot of time reading Zwingli and trying to understand what was he trying to do here? How was he trying to preserve Christ's humanity so that he could be our mediator between God? Because that's really Zwingli's thing. Christ saves us, and he saves us because he took our flesh. If that flesh ceases to be human and becomes something else, becomes something omnipresent, then Christ is no longer our mediator. So that's really where I dug into Zwingli. And naturally, then you get to Luther, because they have this um, kind of historic showdown over these issues. But I wanted to go beyond that. I wanted to get at the root, but also how this worked out. So instead of looking at Calvin per se, I do look at Calvin a bit here. I wanted to look at who follows after Zwingli and how do they continue this idea? So I looked at Heinrich Bollinger, who was Zwingli's successor, and Calvin, and a confession they put out uh, called the Consensus Tigurinus, or the Confession of Zurich, in which they lay out um, the Reformed Doctrine of the Lord's Supper. I w- really would recommend uh, anyone reading that. It, it sounds yeah. complicated, but it's really not. It's a beautiful confession. Yeah, we'll link that to the notes. People can read that too. Yeah, please do. Um, and kind of from there, there issued a new controversy. After Bollinger and Calvin said, this is what we believe about the Lord's Supper, the Lutherans fired back through a guy named Johann Brenz. Now, there are many others, but Brenz is kind of acknowledged as the leading figure And he takes Luther's ideas and really builds on them. Just like Zwingli had kind of an early view of the extra Calvinisticum. So Luther really had an early view of ubiquity and later theologians built this up. And so in response to Brenz was a figure named Peter Martyr Vermigli. Now he's actually a fascinating figure um, who was in some ways the third man of the reformation during Calvin and Bollinger's lifetime. They both trusted that him, they read his works. And in fact, the reason Calvin doesn't write on this is he says in one of his letters, well, Vermigli already did this. Yeah. And Vermigli writes an entire book dedicated to these issues. So I spent a lot of time working through that as this definitive statement. Huh. Yeah, that's good. And it, it, it introduces some people that I think a lot of those who've either researched reform theology, know a little bit about Calvin, haven't heard of these theologians that the Reformed tradition is not just Calvin. He's a huge figure, but it's not just Calvin. And you trace back through some of the church fathers and um, and how they use the church fathers. So, I mean, it's it's a great just historical theological work. This is not new to Reformed theology. It's not new to um, those who've, who've read Calvin, but it's, you know, that was that was helpful. Um, and so with with this and kind of diving into the Lord's Supper with with Christ's presence, so how does, how does our understanding of the Lord's Supper and Christ's presence in it bodily or spiritually through the Spirit affect our understanding of Christ and his two natures? Mm-hmm. Kind of diving so, into the topic with like, is Christ everywhere? Is he just in one single place? Like, how do those two things interact? Yeah, so I, I'd like to turn the question around a little bit. Okay. So I would say we need to begin with Christ's two natures and then go to the sacrament. Got it. Um, I think that's kind of the reform posture to this. So when we think about Christ and we're relying on the church fathers, we're relying especially on Nicaea and the Chalcedonian decree that Christ is one person in two natures, fully human and fully divine. And these two natures are neither confused nor separated. That's our understanding of Christ. And there's a reason for that. This is who Christ must be to save us. He must be God. He must be a human being so that he can die and rise and yet have the worth to suffer for us. And so when we come to the supper, it needs to be understood in light of that. 
of who is Jesus Christ, because it's his supper. It's his presence we're going to. And I do think this is one of the differences between how Luther approaches this and how Zwingli does. Because Zwingli says, no, we need to get Christ and his body right, and then we can understand the supper. Huh. While Luther more goes, no, the supper is this, yeah. and therefore we're going to, he wouldn't say this, but I would, he's going <laughs> to modify his view of Christ's body to fit with his view of the supper. Interesting, okay. Yeah. And so out of that, how are we to understand the Lord's Supper? Well, Christ is present with us always, right? He promises in Matthew 28, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Yeah. Um, but we should be able to ask, well, what do you mean by that, Jesus? Because you just, you know, flip a couple pages later <laughs> yeah. in the Bible and you yeah. leave. So how do we account for this presence and absence? Okay. And what Christology allows us to do is say, well, we actually have some ways to make sense of this. He is present in his divinity because his divinity is everywhere yeah. and is never far from us. And he is absent in his humanity, but he, Jesus Christ, the person is always with us. Okay. And so when we come to the Lord's Supper, we are coming into the presence of that one. And through the spirit and his divine power, we come into contact with his ascended body. Yeah. Um, and this blesses us. Now, the opposite, and this is where Reformed have issue with the Lutheran position, is that by their doctrine of ubiquity and their view of the supper, Christ becomes bodily present on all the altars around the world at this moment. And that's what's required for the blessing. Now, it's similar to the Roman Catholic view, but not exactly the same. Um, and the reform say, look, this compromises his humanity. Uh, a human body isn't everywhere. A human body isn't even in multiple places at once. Yeah. A human body means to be circumscribed, to be located, to be in a place. And if he is human, like we are human, so will he too be in a place? Um, yeah, follow up if you'd like on that. No, that's, that's helpful because I think your average Christian is thinking through this stuff, maybe not explicitly, but they're wondering how can I not like dwell with Christ, but how can Christ be my heart? How can, how can I understand he just left, he's in heaven. How do I, how do I commune with Christ? How do I, how do I pray to him? How am I partaking of the Lord's supper with him? Um, so I think some of those things are good. And even with the, the, the Lutheran, Lutheran debate, it can turn into, well, is his humanity, like, is that inside of his divinity? Does his divinity take over his humanity if it's everywhere? Like how, like if you can kind of describe that too, or if, if we take his divinity as all encompassing and it takes over his body and so he's present everywhere, does that does that strike out his humanity? Like what is what does that do for his two natures? So the the reformed would argue that if Christ's body becomes omnipresent, that is a compromise of what it means to be human. And as we went back to Chalcedon, he is a true man without mixing or change. Yeah. And only God is everywhere. Only God is infinite. And for Christ to become infinite according to his body would be to destroy that as a human body. Mm. And that actually matters because Christ's incarnation isn't a momentary thing. It, it isn't just his earthly ministry. The ascension and the resurrection, more, more pointedly, is Christ taking our body forever. He never gives it up. He never foundationally changes it from being like our body. Yes, it is glorified, yeah. but it is not something utterly different. And there are more careful ways the Lutherans talk about this. I don't want to, you know, disparage them, but uh, the reform, even with their careful explanations, say you're giving to the human what is only divine. Hmm. And by so doing, you're compromising what it means that he is our mediator. Because there's now a sense that he is not like us in his humanity. Yeah, no, that's 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 extremely helpful with with understanding this debate and his two natures. I think that I think I mean either you kind of swing too far to his divine side and he is everywhere, and then what's the role of the spirit, or you swing too far to the human side and there is no divinity to be our mediator mm -hmm. who is able to take that over. Yeah, and so you want to say simultaneously that Jesus Christ, the eternal son, is everywhere and is in heaven as in yeah. a, at where his body is. And that's what the extra is getting at, this, this twofold mystery. And it is a mystery. 
But when we're trying to do theology, we want to make sure we're getting the right mystery and the right biblical balance, right? Um, the Reformed are saying the, the mystery is that he is God and man, that he is infinite and finite at the same time. The mystery isn't that a human body is omnipresent. You see the difference? So the Reformed place the mystery here, yeah. while the Lutherans in the Reformed perspective misplace it on a ubiquitous human body. Yeah, and my guess is your average Christian doesn't know either side of the debate, and so they're trying to figure out how in the world does any of this stuff work. Mm -hmm. So that's that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, and, and to that point, <clears throat> they might kind of throw their hands up and be like, this is so deep and highly academic which we we know is very necessary this conversation um but how can we let them know or communicate to them why this is important to understand and if they need it simplified the average christian in the pew to how they could think about christ and his two natures in the sacraments um why should they why should they care mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's all a good point. And some of this is getting to theological technicalities that had to be discussed in the 16th century, right? And had to be hashed out for clergy and for different traditions. Yeah. Um, but your, your average Christian should still care about these ideas. I mean, yeah, they don't need to know the fancy words or how this all worked out throughout time. But the doctrine itself actually can arise from a very, very simple question that I'm sure one of your kids or one of your Sunday school students could ask, where is Jesus? Yeah. Like, where, where is Jesus? And the answer is actually twofold. He is with us. He is divine. He is God. Jesus is in our midst, right? He is with us always, even to the end of the age. And he's ascended. He is bodily in heaven where he exists to intercede for us with the Father, where he reigns. Mm -hmm. and he is present. And that balance is all about because he is God, he can save us. And because he is human, he could take our sin and he could be our mediator. And that's the real crux of all this. How can we preserve that? Preserve the cross that he truly died a human death and yet was God and preserve our understanding of the resurrection and the ascension, that he remains a human, that he remains a real man and yet was also the divine son and that is a mystery and our purpose for the mystery is not to sort it out it is to confess that mystery mm -hmm. that god has revealed to us mm -hmm. um, and so we we sometimes need to speak more specifically but it's not to it's not to unravel the knot right i always tell my students when you think of a mystery in theology don't think about sherlock holmes right? Sherlock Holmes gets a mystery, he sorts out all the clues, and then by the end, you've solved it. That's not what we're doing here. The mystery is not something to be solved. The mystery, the mysterion, is something revealed by God that is, by definition, beyond us, because God is beyond us. But we do want to confess the right mystery, and, and not something that actually would lead us to end up thinking wrong things about Christ or God the Father. Yeah, that's good. Amen. I yeah. can't, I can't wait till Sunday and taking communion. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm excited. laughs> yeah. You're, you're tasting of the heavenly, heavenly stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you should be excited. And I mean, I always am. Is, uh, at, you know, every time we take the Lord's supper, hopefully yep. every week, yep. um, we are tasting a bit of heaven. We are communing with Christ and we can, uh, too often be distracted by other things, but it is a continual grace and blessing to us that Christ is with us, um, both in his divine nature, but also he connects us to his humanity. And yeah. every time we take the Lord's Supper as a grace, as a blessing, um, and as a foretaste of when we will be with him at the end of the age. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I know something I was thinking, and I'm sure people who are listening to this are thinking too, where before it was, well, it's, I want Jesus in my heart, I want to be with him right now. And but it's a good thing he's in a truly human body in heaven interceding on our behalf because he, if he was just divine we have no intercession we have no mediator we've got no bodily presence in heaven communing with god communing with us that's it's it, it, the debate is 
it's technical, but I think it's a it's a needed debate because if we don't have it, like what where's our mediator? Mm -hmm. And as Hebrews talks about, Christ is our surety. He's passed beyond the veil into the heaven heavenly of heavenlies. You know, the holy of holy, not made by hands, uh, and that's our surety. How can we trust in our salvation? Christ is ascended, and He presents His blood before the Father. How can we trust we'll preserve? Because the ascended Christ in our flesh, our new Adam is interceding for us day in and day out before the Father. And so uh, what I'd, I'd love your listeners and you know yourselves to get here is, yes, there's technical stuff here, but it's really about exalting who Christ is as fully divine and fully man and understanding the fullness of his work. Because we can kind of stop thinking about Jesus at the resurrection. Yeah. Except sometimes we don't even get there and we stop at the cross. <laughs> yeah. We need his entire ministry. Yeah. And in his entire ministry, he is truly God and truly man in one person. And, and that's really at the heart of this doctrine um, when we try to understand it as, as believers. Yeah, yeah. His, it sounds weird, but his ministry is not done at his resurrection. He's still continuing his ministry right now, which I think we forget about that all too often. Mm -hmm. And on that last day when we, <clears throat> it's kind of like a wedding ceremony with him and the church, we're going to have a feast together. Sorry to throw this curveball out there, but is that kind of a foretaste of the the communion and then kind of pointing towards that future feast we'll have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Lord's Supper is also a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb from oh. Revelation 19. And that idea of celebration and that idea that um, as Christ is present with us in the Lord's Supper, now he is even more so then because he will be physically present in the new heavens and the new earth. He will be divinely present and he will be physically present. Just as Thomas could see his scars, so will we. He does not cease to be human for us. There we and go. so in that, um, and yeah, that, that might be complicated. We'll be physical too, yeah. right? We need to remember our uh, resurrection, but that's the true hope here yeah. that yeah. divinely and humanly present is what we want. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, he's divinely present, and we are engaged with his humanity at the Lord's Supper. But at the last day, when he comes again, he will return in his human body that is our body. Huh. There we go. Yeah, that's good. That's, uh, that's a good one to, to end on. So, I mean, thanks for coming on for this. And I, I wanted to point people to anything that you might have coming up where people can find you or see what work you're doing. I know you're a redeemer. So anything you got coming up and where they can find you, contact you and say, Hey, what's Dr. Drake up to? What, can we, what, what more can we learn from him after reading this book? Um, well, I'm working on a, a small piece on fasting in the reformation. So huh. that's uh, going to come out elsewhere. I've also done some writing for modern reformation. So you oh can yeah. Have some of my stuff there. Um, and I'm hoping this summer to begin a new project. Now, you might have to wait a couple of years for that, but I'd like to dig into a lot of these questions a bit more and look at specifically the two states of Christ, his humiliation and exaltation, and how do those really develop uh, during the, the Reformation period and, and before. So that's, that's kind of on the docket for the next few years. I like it. Yeah, just a lot of work on Christ. Not much, yes. not much better to study than that. Yep. Wow, thank you so much for what you do and your work and uh, talking to us. This was incredibly edifying. Yeah, this is helpful. Yeah, so thanks for coming on, Dr. Drake. And if you guys want to find the notes on our podcast page to get this from Oxford University, if you guys are nerds or if you guys want to learn some new stuff, learn about mm -hmm. some new theologians and, and dig deeper into this debate, not just for debate, but to, to learn more about Christ and who he is, what he's done, and, and where he is, and, and why it's a good thing that he's in heaven interceding on our behalf. Mm -hmm.